welcome to everybody. If uh, We're going to go ahead and get started. I know there are a few more people uh, coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, we're here today to talk about the social determinants of health. And many of you, of course, have heard the stories of the person who needed an air conditioner to keep them out of the ER or uh, a refrigerator to keep insulin from going bad. And those are um, stories that we've been hearing for a little while. Um, yet they are, uh, they are a very small component of what we're talking about when we're talking about social determinants of health. Um, social determinants of health, social factors that affect health um, are as broad as poverty. We're talking about um, uh, healthcare, uh, and we're talking about medical care, and we're talking about um, investments in housing, nutrition, criminal justice, and other social supports. Um, this subject is getting a lot of recognition lately, and it's increasing the discussion about what this is, where it's happening, and what the challenges are that, that need to be overcome so that we can break down some of these silos in investments and, um, and move forward. So today we're going to explore the challenges associated with breaking down these silos, and we're going to hear about to what extent this is already happening and uh, what is beginning to happen to address, um, uh, to, to bring together medical needs with social needs, and uh, we're going to be discussing the interaction. So I'd like to first thank our sponsor for today's event, Ascension. And I'm going to turn the mic over for a few minutes to Mark Hayes, who is Senior Vice President of Federal Policy. Great. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Ascension is very, very pleased to sponsor this event. Uh, we think that this is one of the new big things when it comes to health status, because everyone's starting to realize that all these other factors affect someone's health long before they end up in the healthcare system or in someone's emergency room. And Ascension very one is interested in looking at new ways to break down the silos in the federal government to uh, encourage greater interdepartmental cooperation on housing and transportation and nutrition and all these different things that we do to enable communities to be able to overcome those barriers at that individual and community level. So we're very glad that you all are here and excited to hear from the panel. So thank you all very much. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. OK, switching mics and getting into panel mode. So uh, before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to just uh, go over uh, a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you are live tweeting with us today or you'd like to, the hashtag is SDOH, Social Determinants of Health, SDOH. Um, also, I just wanted to let you know that uh, about half of our session today is reserved for Q&A, so get your questions ready. You'll have uh, several different ways in which you can ask your questions once we get to that portion of our program. There are two microphones in the audience if you'd like to stand and ask a question. Also, in your packets, you have a green card. If you would prefer to write a question, once we get to the Q&A portion, um, our staff will be around to collect those cards and will bring them up to me and I will present those questions to the panelists. Um, also, you can tweet your questions if you would prefer, again, using the has hashtag SDOH. Um, I would also, I know it's very early to start begging for this, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, before you leave today, we hope you'll stay for the whole program, but before you leave, whenever that is, you have a small, very brief evaluation in your packets, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill that out before, before you do leave. Okay, so now let's turn to our panel. We have Lauren Taylor, who is health services researcher, is a health services researcher based at Harvard Business School. Lauren is going to provide us with the latest data about how we are dividing our funding between medical and social services. 
She co-wrote a book titled The American Healthcare Paradox, which has received quite a bit of attention for its discussion about the optimal division of resources. David Fukuzawa is Managing Director uh, for Health and Human Services at the Kresge Foundation. David is going to talk about how to achieve that optimal division of resources and how to change clinician thinking in addressing this uh, issue. Samira Fazali is a senior visiting advisor to the Federal Reserve Board of Atlanta's Community and Economic Development Group. And Samira is going to describe examples of cross-cutting collaboration. And finally, Stuart Butler is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's going to identify obstacles to progress and how spending can be reallocated as opposed to coming up with new spending um, to address social determinants. So without further delay, we're going to turn first to Lauren. Super. Ooh, you can hear me. OK, good afternoon, guys. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with you. And I've got uh, seven minutes, I'm on the clock, to run through a bunch of the data that was provided both in the American Healthcare Paradox and since the publication of the book back in 2013. So I thought I would divvy up our time roughly as follows. I can share some of the spending allocation data, which really seemed to kind of galvanize a new conversation about social determinants of health, because for a long time, you know, this has been a field forever in schools of public health, but it often didn't have dollars and cents put to it. And so some of what the book has done and some of what our follow-up work has done is to really say, look, here's how much this stuff costs, and so I'll share that with you. Then I thought I would share a little bit about this, like, huge question of which social services or which social determinants of health do we think has the strongest evidence base. I can tell you what I know. I don't feel a 1,000% confident that that question's answered yet, but I'll give you a sense of, of what the research says. And then I thought I would share just briefly some of the kind of emerging models of integration between health services and social services, and lastly, some of the real challenges that I think we're starting to see among those kind of innovators who are really out there trying new things. OK, I'm down to six minutes. Here we go. Um, so. The book was called The American Healthcare Paradox, and so it's always worth starting there and saying, what is the American Healthcare Paradox? To myself and my co-author, Betsy Bradley, uh, it was this huge amount of spending on health services, something around 18% of GDP, and yet fairly lousy population health outcomes. So if you think there are 34 OECD countries, OECD being the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, when you look at, for instance, maternal mortality, the US ranks 25th out of 34. Life expectancy, 26th out of 34. Low birth weight infants were 28th out of 34. So the paradox is, how could we be spending so much money and putting so much emphasis on health, reforming it, paying more for it, paying differently for it, and still seemingly getting these outcomes that are not top notch? The answer that we came up with was one that had been, again, kicking around schools of public health for a long time. Up to 60% of health is really determined by things other than your healthcare and your genetics. Those are usually called the social determinants of health. And there are things like the environment uh, and the air you breathe, the quality of the water you drink, how much exercise do you get, these sorts of inputs. And so we said to ourselves, OK, well, if we think that 60% of our health is really caused by these social determinants, we're not accounting for that when we're just banging our heads against a wall, saying we're spending 18% of GDP and not getting great health outcomes. So the first insight was, is there another way to think about what each country spends to get a healthy population and really build that into the empirical analysis so we could see something different? So everyone has seen the bar chart of health service spending in all the OECD countries, and the US is always huge, right, at 18%, much more than any of our peers. And this was kind of the first iteration of our data analysis where we said, well, what if we stack social service spending on top of health service spending? So what you're seeing here is all the OECD countries on the x-axis. The blue bars are health service spending, and the orange bars are social service spending. And social service spending is kind of a proxy for what we were thinking about as attention paid to social determinants of health. That's spending on housing, education, police, jobs, training, nutrition, these kinds of things. And so what we found is if you stack those bars and you look at, as a whole, health and social, what does the US spend, we're no longer a huge spender. We kind of look more middling. 
But when we created this bar graph, there was one other really interesting feature, which is if you look closely, the US is the only country apart from Mexico, which is the smallest bar all the way over on your right, the only country that spends more on healthcare than social. And in fact, we have almost a completely inverted ratio from what the like hypothetical average OECD country is. So to put that more simply, for every dollar we spend on healthcare in the US, we match that with 90 cents on social services, whereas in the average OECD country, every $1 spent on healthcare is matched by $2 on social services. So that's an interesting insight, but of course what's key is does it matter? And this was kind of the beginning of this whole book journey, um, and now my PhD. What we found was that this ratio of health service to social service spending is actually more predictive of health outcomes at the country level than your health service spending or your social service spending alone. So we found it to be very associated with infant mortality, premature death, longer life expectancy, the kinds of things that we've always had so much trouble actually attaining in the US. Then the next question that we got was, okay, well, Lauren, it's interesting that you, know, you can do this across countries. You can compare us to Switzerland and Norway. Can you do it inside the US? So this is what this graph shows you. It's a heat map, again, of this same ratio, social to healthcare spending, where your kind of Kelly green are your uh, states that most prioritize social service spending, and your red are those who most strongly prioritize health service spending. You all can locate your home state, and we can talk more in Q&A about um, what this looks like and what it means. Unfortunately, I think this heat map looks a great deal like virtually every other heat map you see in health services or public health, where we have this real challenge down in kind of the Bible Belt, um, which raises questions about, is it the ratio that's driving the health outcomes, or do like poor health conditions drive the ratio, right? Because sick people consume a lot of health care. And so there's something of a vicious cycle that happens here where the causal, er causal arrows can go both ways. Nevertheless, uh, we published this just in Health Affairs in May, and so it was a replication of the work that we had initially done at the OECD at the states. And all of this, I think, is just pointing to expanding our horizons when we're really thinking about what to do to create healthy populations. It's no longer that the conversation needs to be bounded just around medical care, quality, access, insurance. Suddenly, it seems all the more important to really be thinking broadly about those inputs. The question of which social services really produce better health and save healthcare dollars is a difficult one. Uh, the team that I'm on has worked pretty hard to put together this lit review, which I think you all received in your packets. But in short, I would say that if you look at the research and just are asking for what has the strongest evidence base, there are three categories. Housing comes up very, very strong. Lots of randomized control trials, lots of very strong research design in the housing literature. Nutrition support, particularly around women, infants, and children, and older Americans, is another one that I would feel very confident saying to you, you're probably going to get a positive return on investment. And the third is case management. And importantly, I would just say, I think it's case management with home visitation. That seems to be a real differentiator in the case management literature between uh, studies that show no effect, or in some cases, negative effect, and those that really show a positive effect. I would just show briefly this slide to kind of whet your appetite for Q&A. I think there's always this question of, okay, you've showed us a ratio, Lauren. Are you saying we have to spend more on social services? I would never discourage you from doing so, but I think there are other ways to think creatively about how to get social service delivery kind of fortified. One of them is really integrating and coordinating better from existing health service delivery and existing social service delivery. And this slide kind of shows you a little bit of different strategies that health systems are using to kind of extend their reach into the community and into social service delivery. One example is out in Portland, four health systems recently pooled their resources to invest $21.5 million in affordable housing which was one of the kind of biggest and boldest, I think, forays of a health system into social services and social determinants. And then lastly, I would just flag for you, among the groups that are really trying to do this and I think are out in front, the real challenge and where the rubber hits the road is in contracting between health and social services. And you can see here some of the reasons why. One I would highlight is just that HIPAA creates really enormous concerns and challenges where health service providers want to be able to share information about a patient with someone at a food pantry or a homeless shelter, or even you could think a school, 
Um, and of course, there's a lot of trepidation. No one wants to be caught violating HIPAA. And so, again, we can return to this, but that would be one thing to flag for you all as policymakers to think creatively about how you could push this forward. Thanks. So good afternoon. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to hope to sort of continue on what Lauren started because uh, what she talked about, in fact, uh, you know, is uh, very central to the story of the Kresge Foundation. What I want to be able to do is to be able to tell you um, the story of how we got to um, the, uh, the, the point in terms of our grant-making strategy to think about this connection between social determinants and, and health. So just a little bit about the Kresge Foundation. We're actually not a health foundation, so we're not a Robert Wood Johnson uh, or a Kaiser Permanente. We're actually um, focused on expanding urban opportunities, so we're a community development foundation. But we have a health program within that. And, and, and we started 10 years ago. Um, the, the foundation itself is over 90 years old, but we, 10 years ago, we really started on a, on a new track of thinking more strategically about our grant making. And, so we were given the, the sort of opportunity to sort of think about health within this larger urban opportunity framework and what it is that really drives health. And so we were looking at the same data that, that uh, Lauren was looking at, this, uh, the, the OECD data showing that we're getting terrible outcomes but paying the most money for it. So it's terrible value for the healthcare dollar that we pay for. And, all, and there was also this other emerging evidence that you know, we can improve health by looking upstream. And so we started from the beginning by thinking about a health program that was focused on this. So not a health program focused on health care per se, but on the social determinants. Um, so we have two main strands. So one is really looking specifically at the environmental and social conditions that actually contribute to health. And we have three specific focus areas. So one is, is on housing, which, which Lauren mentioned. The other is on food systems. Uh, as many of you know, there are parts of the country um, where people do not have access to fresh, healthy food. Um, even in Fresno, which is like, you know, you could say the heart of the Central Valley or parts of it, people in the city don't have access to, you know, healthy food. Um, and, and the third area is uh, built environment and, and transportation. But the other strand was, was sort of thinking about how we think about health in this, this country. And there, there's a lot of money in the health system. Three trillion dollars of, you know, that, 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 that is part of the healthcare system in this country. And as you saw, saw from the, the, the graphic that, that Lauren shared, you know, is there a way to sort of rethink how those healthcare dollars are spent? So this is what we call accelerating our community-centered approaches to health. And this, was, this started out on sort of, at first, a clever pl play on the patient-centered health. Uh, but it, this term has actually caught currency you know, in the healthcare field, sort of talking about what is sort of the community-centeredness part of this. And let me talk to you briefly about our journey. So back in 2008, we were looking at the possibility of healthcare reform and the, the possibility that 20 million people newly insured would show up at the doorstep of community health centers, which is sort of the federal network of you know, community-based clinics serving the underserved poor. There was no capacity. In fact, there was uh, talk about a $9 billion short, shortfall in terms of infrastructure. How are we going to finance this? Um, and um, because we have a very strong social investment practice uh, as part of our, our work. And, and, and and how could we sort of mix this with uh, the idea of community development? Banks, in fact, weren't going to lend to community health centers because they didn't understand the business. Um, but we, we found in the community development finance sector an interest because we had actually a long track record of, of, in the community development field of, of funding low-income development, housing in particular. And we found that we could actually uh, match, and Samir is going to talk a little bit more about this, low-income housing tax credits and new markets to, to kind of basically add on community uh, health services into housing and other low-income uh, development projects. And this led to um, a couple of things. Uh, one is the Healthy Futures Fund, which Samir is going to talk about, which is, in fact, this mixing of financing. And then something that we looked at in terms of how, do we, how can we actually leverage 
social determinants through community health centers. So in other words, getting community health centers to think outside the box because they actually have a long tradition of thinking this way. For those of you who know the history, Jack Geiger, who's one of the pioneers of the community health center movement in this country, famously prescribed food for his patients because he said that would make them healthier than any medicine. Um, so uh, flashing forward to now, we now suddenly we've rediscovered his truth. So the Safety Enhancement Initiative was, was our first attempt to sort of match or connect community health centers to um, the social determinants, these community factors that contribute to health, which then led to our thinking about this sort of community-centered approach. And uh, I'm just gonna briefly sort of list and talk about you know, what, what this led into in the last several years, several initiatives that we are in the midst of. Um, one many of you may have heard of is the Build Health Challenge, which is a collaboration with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Beaumont Foundation, Colorado Health Foundation, the advisory board company, and, um, and now uh, we've just added two or three other regional foundations. Uh, but this idea basically is to um, incentivize health systems to build partnerships with organizations in the community to address a disparity um, using their community benefit dollars for that purpose. Uh, and to sort of build this collaboration around social determinants. Um, and uh, we had an overwhelming response to the first round, and we're in the midst of selecting a second round, uh, and we can certainly talk about that. The one in the middle is moving health care upstream, uh, which is to take advantage of the fact that health systems right now are actively in the process of really thinking hard about how do we connect to upstream factors. Um, and we, we noticed that there was a growing number of innovators in this space, and this was an, an initiative um, that, that is with UCLA and Nemours um, to provide the space and infrastructure for the innovators to really come together and to build working prototypes and to be able to test this in a larger network. Um, at the bottom is PREPARE, which stands for Protocol for Responding to and Assessing Patients' Assessment Risks and Experiences, and that's just simply a long way of talking about, you know, we have electronic health records which, you know, capture uh, patient data, specifically physical health data, but there was no way of capturing these social factors. And this is actually now a, a tested, um, uh, basically add-on to the EHR system to, um, assess for these social risk factors. So we can now actually, um, when a patient comes into an office, uh, think about those upstream factors that, are, that may be more influential to a person's health than the physical ones. Um, and then on the top is one that we're still developing called, um, or sort of right below community-centered health initiatives, a community-centered health homes initiative, which is to really expand this idea that community health centers, uh, which are located in the communities of most need, how can they leverage social determinants in their work and expand this? Because there is now a clear, large cohort of, of community health centers that are in the middle of, of this kind of work. So that's really just a snapshot of the kinds of things that we're doing um, and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, David. So now we're on to Samira from the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. Uh, thank you to the Alliance for Health in Maryland for inviting me here today. Um, I'm not going to use slides. I'm just going to talk to everyone. And I'm going to start off by reminding you that uh, my remarks do not represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta or the Federal Reserve System writ large. They merely represent my own views. So I work as a researcher there at the Atlanta Fed, and I study the intersection of health and community development in particular, and it grows out of a wider body of research that my colleagues at the San Francisco Fed have been conducting for the past few years. So some of you may be familiar with their work in this space. What I'm gonna do is build on our first two speakers and talk further about the potential role for the community development sector to be better leveraged in um, as being a disruptive and a constructive force in helping the healthcare system spend its dollars more wisely and push us towards more population health models out there. So I'm not gonna talk about social determinants of health because Lauren covered it, but in essence, research really shows that zip code is a bigger driver of health than genetic code. And the question isn't really whether environmental or social factors impact health. The bigger question is what can or should be done about it. 
So that's what brought us at the Federal Reserve System into the conversation, because we, we suspected that the community development industry could be brought into the conversation to help answer the question. Um, how many of you are familiar with the alphabet soup and community development, like CDCs, anyone, and CDFIs? Okay, they're more, CDFIs are more boutiques, so I wasn't sure folks knew them, because they finance a lot of community development transactions. But in essence, what community developers do is strengthen the economic, social, or physical environments in low-income or distressed communities. They will take any approach that works, basically. They may run an after-school program in one place, build affordable rental in another, or do small business development in a third, but it all depends on what the residents' needs are, what resources can be assembled, and what assets can be leveraged. They're very entrepreneurial, and they don't just use grants to do their work. They're not just using philanthropic um, grants and public dollars, but they oftentimes are leveraging private sector capital. So in this way, they offer an opportunity to mix market discipline and social purpose. Um, and they've become experts at managing cross-sector collaborations. I mean, you saw Lauren's slides and David's slides. We're trying to get lots of different systems talked to talk to one another, and that's precisely what the community development industry does for a living. Um, the, other the two other reasons we thought they'd be powerful in this work is that they have expertise at working with the same populations that um, social services, Medicaid, Medicare are all serving. And they know how to build trust with the community because their work requires them to integrate the community's voice into projects. And then the last expertise they really offer is intervening at the environmental and social levels. Um, so, what we think community development has to offer healthcare is an expertise in crafting multi-sector, public-private partnerships that invest in community-driven projects. So I'll spend the remainder of my time really giving some examples of what that could be, what that could look like. First is, let's start with a financing question um, since David started talking about the Healthy Futures Fund. They can help finance new partnerships focused on addressing social determinants of health. Um, so Kresge worked with LISC, which is a leading CDFI out there, and Morgan Stanley, a bank, to develop this $100 million fund to finance projects that were going to address social determinants of health. And it was such a success, and hopefully David can talk about it more, that you guys committed another $100 million in 2015, so there's going to be another round of projects here. They've been able to do work in rural areas and urban areas alike. In Michigan, in rural Michigan, they took a blighted building, converted it to affordable um, apartments with on-site health services. In Massachusetts, they helped finance a health clinic and grocery store co-locating so you could do some more targeted healthy food work. And that's in Brockton, so a small town in Massachusetts. Um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, the interesting thing they did was finance a larger affordable housing deal with a health clinic, but also gave it a grant because they needed grant capital to do more market research on what the health needs were in that community. Um, the, the, the fund is innovative in part because it shows you what you can do with existing federal resources. They use the low income housing tax credit and the new markets tax credit, two treasury incentives to catalyze private sector capital into community development deals. The second place um, we, we look at places where community developers are helping is to help plug gaps in care coordination to drive better utilization of healthcare resources. So I've been studying a hospital in South Florida, um, Baptist Healthcare, and they have a, um, a hospital called Homestead Hospital in their system that has partnered with a community-based organization called Catalyst Miami, where Catalyst provides wraparound social services to Homestead patients. Um, and the partnership is funded by Homestead's IRS-mandated community benefit spending. Um, Homestead donates office space and gives straight grants to Catalyst for this work. But what it offers is a powerful example of the business case behind this because the care coordination has actually improved um, Cat um, Homestead's healthcare spending. They saw decreases in uncompensated ER visits by uninsured patients, and when they developed a targeted program on diabetic and cardiac care patients, Homestead saw readmission rates drop from 22% to just under 6% in a year. 
And the third place you may look for some um, interesting partnerships is uh, sharing data and expertise to solve joint problems. Um, here we're starting to, just starting to see some examples, I think, of da data sharing that has been driven by the first round of the ACA's Community Health Needs Assessment um, process, the CHNAs. Um, this is a very new obligation on hospitals to collect input from the community and public health experts to document the local health needs and develop an action plan on how the hospital will or will not address them. Um, the hope is that the mandate can help integrate more cross-sector conversations and even draw hospitals into being public champions on public health issues. Uh, this can be really powerful because in many places, hospitals are the top employer and a key anchor of the local economy. So if a hospital gets engaged in local issues, it voice really carries weight among civic leaders. Um, but it's been very spotty and uneven. A lot of hospitals you talk to still say they run these like a check the box exercise, but two I'll point to for you to consider is in Cincinnati, the Children's Medical Center mapped um, the addresses of kids who are being readmitted for asthma um, as part of their CHNA. And it made the community realize that there was a cluster of substandard housing all owned by the same landlord. So the Legal Aid Society could use that data to organize attendance and compel repairs. Um, in, out in California, St. Joseph's Health System identified housing as a top priority for its community and so joined the local affordable housing coalition. Um, so I'll end by uh, having you, I don't want you to just think that's a neat array of random transactions out there, but to really see how it could connect to your own work here and what you can do to further uh, collaboration, innovation, and experiment experimentation at the local level here. So the three suggestions I'll, I'll leave you to think about or perhaps ask more questions are is first, the community benefits in CHNA process I mentioned a lot of people feel are really ripe for further improvement. It's very hit or miss. Some of those dollars aren't wisely spent. And so researchers have been discussing ways to improve its enforcement or strengthen its focus on social determinants of health. I think there's a lot that the Community Reinvestment Act that banks um, have to fulfill. That process can kind of teach and, and, and uh, help guide the further transformation of the community benefit and CHNA system. So I'm happy to talk about that if there's interest in Q&A. The second is local innovators will consistently tell you how difficult it is to cobble money from many different federal programs. If you're successful enough to raise money from HHS, HUD, and Treasury, the compliance burden may still cripple you in implementation. So I'll point you to what I thought was a really interesting innovation, the performance partnership pilots for disconnected youth. Do folks know that? Pi that? Okay, not many. It, it was authorized in the 2014 Appropriations Bill, and what it lets you do at the local level is blend formula and competitive grants across multiple federal agencies into one common pot with one common set of reporting rules. It requires a high level of evidence that the inter intervention works for its purpose, but I, I, it's, it's a really interesting model. Um, and the last is the, the federal government can play a powerful role helping scale evidence-based interventions. Lauren gave us that great list of what the research says is really um, dr uh, drives better outcomes and better spending. So I think that if you look at the Corporation for National and Community Services Social Innovation Fund, it offers you a ready mechanism to help scale evidence-based interventions across the country. So I look forward to Q&A, and I hope that my uh, remarks helped you think about the way you can activate local creativity um, to help reduce cost, improve quality, and improve access. Great, thank you, Samira. We're gonna turn now to Stuart Butler of Brookings. And a reminder that after we hear from Stuart, we're gonna have a Q&A session, so we'll be getting your questions ready. And also, if you're with us on Twitter, hashtag is S-D-O-H, Stuart. Great, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And in my work at Brookings, I've really been looking at exactly what you've heard from the other uh, panelists and sort of uh, mulling over with a whole bunch of other people coming together regularly to think what is the right, what is the best policy environment that will help encourage exactly what you've been hearing about in terms of cross-sector uh, collaboration to produce uh, health. In fact, we've got a, a study that just came out last week, um, which I think is outside, looking at hospitals and schools as hubs. And what this does is say, well, let's look at those, the potential, and say what's in the way and what do we need to do to actually facilitate these institutions in, in, uh, uh, in communities. And I want to look at three broad areas of, uh, 
of difficulty, of challenge uh, uh, regarding these things, which, uh, regarding these approaches which has been, uh, been mentioned. Uh, the data question, or at least data sharing, looking at business models, and, I would, and by the way, I would very much suggest you look at Lauren's piece, uh, the healthcare uh, blog, specifically on thinking about business models of, of hospitals and health systems, uh, and then the payment system. Uh, and these are all really linked together uh, and reinforce each other as barriers or as problems. Uh, just to touch very briefly on the data uh, question. Uh, if you're going to do things differently and you're going to create uh, interesting partnerships, both in order to know what you should be doing and what's going to pay off as for your operations, and also to convince other funders or funders to support this kind of activity, you've got to have good data and good evaluation uh, of that data. That's a big problem uh, for many, many uh, institutions. There are many barriers uh, to collecting and sharing uh, data. One is size of organizations, very small organizations find it very difficult to create the infrastructure for data. You've got issues associated with privacy, uh, both in the health area uh, through the HIPAA rules, but also if you're dealing with schools through, uh, through uh, privacy uh, issues with, with regard to student data. So there's lots of issues associated with that. One can begin to get around this kind of problem with guidance from government agencies in particular, the federal government has been doing a pretty good job uh, in giving guidance, but it needs to be stepped up uh, even more. Uh, part of the problem with HIPAA is often you can do things if you, if you understand the rules, uh, but many organizations flinch from doing it because they're afraid of being sued or afraid of getting into trouble. So giving guidance and giving particular safe harbor guidance, in other words, giving indications of if you work in this particular area and do these kinds of things, then you're going to be pretty much on safe ground. There's a lot that can be done uh, in terms of, in, of improving the data flow uh, in, in organizations and also between agencies. Agencies are often very uh, um, protective of the data they have uh, at all levels of the government. And it's very important to look at ways of facilitating those. And again, there, there's some efforts in that uh, area. Data is also very important for showing um, uh, the actual return on investment. And here we have the problem of it's not just within your sector, but in order to show what an investment in your sector will mean in the future, you've got to be able to show its impacts in other sectors. And this is a big problem in terms of just our lack of capacity for doing that kind of measurement. Uh, and so building capacity in that area where I think philanthropy is and has an important role is, is crucial. The second area I want to touch on quickly is the business model problem. We have business models uh, which are in many ways a reflection of the payment systems we have in health and other sectors that make it very difficult uh, to do a lot of creative, collaborative approaches between uh, sectors. Think of fee service hospitals, for example. I I've looked at a number uh, of them. And so a fee service hospital recognizes, reads all the literature, uh, and, and the, uh, the public health people there say, oh, it'd be really good if we uh, helped invest in nutrition, and work with the homeless and so on, that would do a great job. So they go to the chief, uh, the chief financial officer of the hospital and say, hey, we've got this great idea. We're gonna incur all these costs associated with this, and the net effect is fewer people will have to come to the hospital. So the CFO says, this does not compute. Uh, so until you have revenue that in some way reflects and gives an incentive for investing, say, in a hospital, uh, it's gonna be very difficult. The same is true when you look at things like schools of bill of the school nurse or a school health uh, center can do tremendous work uh, in improving the general health of the community, including parents and so forth. But when it comes to a budget issue in the health, uh, in the uh, education budget, what's one of the first things to go or to be cut back? You don't cut back on the teachers, you cut back on these peripheral uh, issues, uh, areas. So looking at how to change the flow of money so that one has dedicated funding for health-related activities within schools is a critical uh, step forward. Let me just uh, end this part by saying that, uh, as Samira uh, has mentioned, one of the things that is happening, though, is that we're seeing now for, for nonprofit hospitals an inducement, an encouragement through IRS requirements to say, go out and look in the community and see what has to happen. And in order to comply with your uh, uh, tax-exempt status, do something uh, in that area. So more and more hospitals are moving in that area, and that's good. We also have, for, of course, for financial institutions, as Samir well knows, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act that says, 
financial institutions need to focus on lower income uh, communities and start to figure out ways to help in that area. And they do some of which, uh, such as through the CDFIs, uh, translate into, into health activities. We've also now just passed the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which has requirements on school districts and states to actually look at failing schools and say, what's going on in the community there? So I have a great idea. Why don't all these different uh, requirements actually talk to each other and say, within a community, how can we blend together uh, these requirements and start doing it on a, on a consistent basis? There's a lot of opportunity, I think, for doing that, and we should move forward. The last thing I will just say very quickly, given the time, is that so much of this hinges on the payment systems, as I've mentioned, whether it be a hospital or a school, at all levels of the, of the federal system, not just at the federal level. So we need to look at ways of encouraging, uh, through fine-tuning and tweaking the funding, for organizations to plan together at the very least, so that when we're spending in different areas, at least you start bringing those agencies together to start planning so that they do it consistent with each other. Uh, there's been some good movement in that area at the federal level. Some agencies like HUD and HHS and the Education Department are beginning to build um, sort of ad hoc councils to plan together. We see this a lot at the state level as well. Uh, uh, more than half the states now have what's called children's cabinets. And this is really um, below the governor's level and, and agency heads uh, from different sectors that are interested in children. And they now are working together in education, in health, and so on, to say, what can we do to improve the trajectory, the life of, of children in those areas? So councils of this kind, which are very um, prevalent at the state level, are the kinds of things that you can, can look at. Uh, and then finally, uh, as others have said, th there need to be steps to specifically look at ways to blend or braid money together. Blending means literally kind of pooling it all together and saying, what's the best way to get the outcome we want, whether it be health or some other area? Braiding means that these, this money is still running in parallel trajectories, uh, parallel programs, but you actually look at ways of, of linking them together on the ground in, in, uh, for specific outcomes. So looking at ways of doing that and improving that uh, is going to be very, very important to achieving the kinds of uh, breakthroughs that we've uh, been talking about today. So I think there are various uh, steps. That's just touching on a, on a small number of them. There are a number of very specific policy steps that can and should be taken uh, to enable the kinds of collaboration that you've been hearing about to actually take place. We've got some progress in those areas. Uh, we need to look at things like the waiver process and others to improve the braiding and blending of money. And if we do that, I think we'll see really significant uh, impact from these kinds of collaborative ventures. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. A reminder, again, if you'd like to ask a question, now is the time to step up to the microphone or pull out your green card and to write a question. Um, I'm going to start off the questions for our panelists by asking about the new delivery system and payment reforms um, that we have seen uh, throughout our system, both in the private sector and also through Medicaid. Um, we were, you know, we're into all kinds of demonstrations on ACOs and bundled payments and, and new ways of trying things. Um, are we seeing any more of this kind of activity within these experiments? Is it making a difference? And is this where the future is? I'm happy to start us off. Um, I think it is making a difference. And I think the, the trap that I even fall into sometimes is thinking that um, there's so much discussion in health policy about value-based financing, it's easy to think we're there. You know, it's a reality. And these large hospitals and health systems are running primarily on ACO contracts or value-based financing, but in fact, we're not. Um, and so I think it's important to be sensitive to the fact that most health systems or providers in general really feel like they're standing with a foot in each canoe. You know, one foot is still in a fee-for-service world where, as Stuart was alluding to, if you do too good a job, if you make people too healthy, you're kind of undercutting your own revenue or business stream while they also have one foot in this value-based financing world and are trying to figure out with a myriad of metrics how to deliver on the promise of these particular quality 
measures. And so it's very difficult for them just, you know, I study management. And when I talk to managers, healthcare administrators, often their response to my interest in social determinants is just like, we don't have brain bandwidth to do that because we have so much going on trying to figure out how we're going to make this transition successful. That being said, I think the places you are seeing the most innovation around social determinants are the ones who are most strongly with that foot in a value-based financing world. They're either in multiple ACO contracts or they're in one of these new kind of Medicaid redesigned states. In Massachusetts, we're going into um, a series of ACOs that are total cost of care capitation for Medicaid clients. And so there, you are seeing people get off the dime very quickly because when you say to a system, you've got $5,000 for each person for the year, and that's your budget. If you go over it, if they come in, if they churn in and out of the ED, or they churn in and out of the hospital, you're eating that. All of a sudden, these administrators are like, oh, Lauren, come, tell me about social determinants of health. What do I do? What's the best choice? So I do think that we're seeing this association between the type of financing um, or payment scheme that providers are in and their interest and willingness to put in upfront costs to kind of build new programs. That being said, there's always a risk that they feel it's working too well and cutting too strongly into this backside fee-for-service business, which is still ongoing, often in like very consequential amounts. And I would agree that there's a lot happening. From a policy point of view, a particular thing that's happening on, on accountable health is that in some of these contracts, the idea is if you save money as a provider, you're supposed to get some of that savings back. But what's happening, the states are taking some of that money. And so it kind of removes the incentive to, to save money. So from a policy point of view, I think that's a particular hole that needs to be filled in. I, I, in answer to your question, Marilyn, I think there's a, there's a lot happening. Uh, and I would just like to uh, uh, sort of like um, identify the three, three things that we've sort of, well, two things we've talked about and one thing we haven't. So one is actually how we pay for this, and, and is there a different way of paying for what we have? Because obviously, fee-for-service does not really pay for outcomes. It just pays for the service. And so to the extent that we can begin to sort of pay for real value, you know, there are places that are moving along that track incompletely, but it's, 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 I think that this, we will be somewhere you know, within the next few years uh, getting there. Two is community benefit dollars. So for nonprofit hospitals, this is another source of money that can actually be used for community health purposes. The third um, pot of money, which we haven't talked about, is in fact there's a meeting tonight in, in DC and tomorrow with, uh, called the sort of um, the Anchor Institution Collaborative. Um, it, it, these are primarily health systems that are really thinking about their role as anchor institutions um, because besides community benefit dollars, which is in, in essence sort of charitable dollars that you're returning back to the community uh, as, as part of your um, you know, nonprofit uh, community benefit, um, health systems are really rethinking about their total impact on communities. So Kaiser Health, uh, Kaiser Permanente calls this total health. And that is everything that they do, every dollar that they, that they spend actually has impact. That's on hiring. That's on buying, that's on real estate. And if you think about how health systems have sometimes the largest imprint, especially in, in communities where every other industry has fled, that's an important thing to think about. And, 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 and we're, people are beginning to sort of think about the total impact of the health system on the health of the community, which gets to kind of, uh, I think, Stuart's point. But the area that, that we have seen probably the, the biggest traction is something that, um, that Lauren brought up in her presentation, but where is the best dollar spent on health services or, or on social non-medical services, and that's in, in housing. Because most um, uh, chief financial um, officers of a health system will tell you that their biggest cost is, uh, you know, they're 80% of their costs on 20% of their patients, and most of those are folks that are cycle in and out of e ERs. And often they are, have unstable housing, often they're chronically homeless, and have multiple diseases, chronic diseases. So. It's that um, uh, dual eligible category, Medicare and Medicaid, um, in any case, poor populations that are unstably housed. And the be best way to get to a reduced dollar is actually thinking about something like permanent supportive housing. So there is now a huge, and I would say huge at this point, push in both the housing side and the healthcare side to sort of think about this problem together. Uh, there's meetings actually here today and tomorrow in DC about, about this issue, and, and we'll see more to come. 
I just came from National Academies, which is going to be issuing a consensus report on precisely this issue sometime next year. So stay tuned. The only thing I would add is that I think that a lot of people in this room have the power to pull the stories out of their districts because stuff is happening. And us up here who are researching it can't find all the examples we want to talk about all the time. You definitely hear from, a, I definitely hear from a lot of the hospital and healthcare administrators I talk about, I talk to that they're just so overwhelmed with how much change has happened in healthcare in the past few years. They would love to take this issue on, but they just don't know how to begin to do it. So I think that there's a hungry audience for it if you can spoon feed it to them a little and the federal government can sometimes do some really powerful things with just the research it puts out and the best practices it puts out, um, kind of the spotlighting role you have to play here. I think as we've all said, I mean, the, um, there's enormous importance of capitated managed care in encouraging these kinds of incentives. That's only going to work if either in the private sector or, or, and in the public sector, there's a willingness to pay for a whole range of things that are not what we normally think of as medical care. Uh, because ultimately what you want to see, if you look at, at, uh, at Lauren's first uh, charts, is really we want to see a movement of money, quite frankly, away from medical services into health-related services. That means a big sectoral change, which is not exactly going to be enthusiastically embraced uh, by a lot of people in the health uh, sector. That's why it's important to think of the business model of a managed care organization or a hospital and so on as not just giving medical services, you know, drugs and cutting you open and things like that, but to actually cover and be engaged in these other areas. So I imagine sort of hospitals and health systems in the future being much more than, than medical facilities and widening their role. I think if we, if we think of it that way, uh, it's the right way to think of it as a business model. It's the right way to think of it as how you would get revenue and, and spending to alter within that. And I think it, it, quite frankly, addresses the political issue of how do you see one sector beginning to shrink and another expanding in order to reach the common goal of improved health. So, uh, Stuart, you've talked a lot about shifting, and all of you have talked about, uh, um, you know, how this, we're talking about a decent amount of money here. Uh, housing is not cheap. So if we are providing some social services and we're simply reallocating some of this money so that we're not spending as much on the actual medical services, um, talk a little bit more about where you see that money coming from. What won't we need in the way of medical care um, if we are pushing some of that money to social services, or is this something that just happens automatically because these people are then healthier, so they don't require more care? What, what, what exactly are you envisioning? Well, well, think, think of the elderly, for example. Uh, think of how many elderly Americans end up in, in hospitals because they fall and break their hip. They then end up in a nursing home for the rest of their life, particularly if they're low-income people and can't afford supports outside. And so there's enormous healthcare costs associated with that. If we were to improve the way in which people age in their own homes, we have here in, the, in, in Washington, D.C., one of the premier examples of, of senior villages. These are uh, within communities uh, of a mixture of, well, mainly uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that are really linking together the services people need, including medical services, for people to stay in their own home. Enormous reduction, potential reductions in costs associated with that. So it really is a question, I think, of, of of seeing a diversion of funding ultimately from the acute care medical area into these areas like housing, like social services, and so on that enable people to stay out of the hospital and the, and the healthcare system generally. That's an important, I mean, how we do this through waivers, through experimentation, and so on is what we're now engaged in. But I think ultimately you could see a huge flow of funding from, these, from the, the medical sector per se into these other sectors. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questioners uh, who would like to uh, hear more about how exactly you blend and braid funding. There are, um, uh, there are uh, as I think a lot of you have mentioned, there are some conflicting incentives. For example, if you spend money at HUD for housing, it's, it is the medical programs that are going to benefit from seeing reduced spending. So how do you 
deal with the incentive issue and also how do you braid or blend this kind of funding? So I'm certainly not the expert on this panel about specifically how to do that with federal dollars, but I would just point out um, this is the key. I was just so glad that it was brought up earlier. This is the key that we see in all of the other countries that do this really, really well, is they have a single-payer healthcare system that also is a single-payer on the social service side, right? And I'm not saying we need to go to a single-payer, but it's important to understand the logic of how the full return on investment is captured when you're paying both sides, you're paying both sectors. The best example I think we have here in the US is actually the VA. They pay health and they pay benefits. And as a result, one of the things that we profiled in the book is some really innovative work that the VA actually does around blending these financing streams. It's not really a blend for them, although I'm sure if you looked at their books it is, but um, they're doing co-location and they also are able to capture the full return on investment and not kind of lose all of these, lose the return to the friction associated with coordination costs between the sectors. So, I'll let others speak to the kind of logistics on how you do it, but I would just underscore that this is the kind of thinking that we need to somehow get to is one pot of money, one set of investments, one return on investment. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a, a question that I think kind of varies depending on what you're sort of trying to solve, but I'll, let me go back to the housing one because people are going to this area for a number of reasons. You know, one is, one is certainly, as Lauren pointed out, the results that you're getting, but also the cost savings to be had. That's why it's become such a big, big area. So uh, we've talked about the kind of um, the high flyers or the chronic high utilizer population, but it turns out, in the, in the case of Samira pointed out, that also for children, housing is also a factor. And in fact, you know, asthma is the biggest chronic disease of young children. And if you can reduce uh, hospital visits that are, that are triggered by housing-related you know, um, asthmogens, then you also can save money. And um, so the attention, at least the health systems, are beginning to sort of think about that. What that is driving, at least at, at, a lo at local level, is in fact this connection between housing and health, which is why there's a lot of conversation about how exactly we do this, and we have GHHIs and in the, the audience, and uh, if you're looking, if you want to talk to folks that are sort of in this space, uh, how do you braid this money? They're, they're the folks to talk about. Um, just because, you know, um, we have kind of two knowns. We, we sort of understand like housing finance, and we kind of understand health finance. And if we could sort of figure that out together, you know, then we can achieve, you know, multiple wins. And it, it, what's happening right now is, in fact, a lot of local experimentation about how, to, how that happens. The other area, especially from this room's point of view, is how we, uh, what opportunities there are with Medicaid dollars, especially on an expanded Medicaid. Um, and even in states that haven't expanded, they're pushing this. Uh, how can we think more creatively about, uh, especially patients that need the dollars the most, you know, who have actually a lot of non-medical needs? And that is a very active conversation. Um, that is less about braiding dollars as opposed to sort of thinking more um, creatively about how to achieve better outcomes with the dollars we have. Uh, because clearly you have to, you have to go upstream uh, with uh, um, underserved populations. You, know, you, you, you can't do this in ERs and uh, in, in, in expensive medicines. It's just it's unsustainable. There are multiple levels you can think about braiding and blending funding and how do you get it done. At the transaction level, at the community level, um, I mean, I'll speak at a really basic level here. If you can get a grant into a community and a CDFI can work with a bank, they can, because they have the grant capital there, they'll have much lower um, financing costs to deliver the project. and. Um, and so there's a lot of there's a, a lot of role that grants can play at the local level, but then can level leverage things like CRA obligations and new markets tax credit, low income housing tax credit, different incentive programs we have out there that actually uh, require the nonprofits at the local lever, level to to uh, draw in private sector uh, capital into the transaction and into the deal. So for those of you who staff different um, agencies and committees, I would think about which are those programs that do that kind of catalytic investment um, at the federal level. Um, I'll point again to performance partnership pilots, and what they did was there was um, 
statutory waivers given to the agencies to waive certain requirements to actually allow the, the blended and braided approach to happen at the local level, level, there is going to have to be, you're gonna to have to look basically at what you're asking and requiring of agencies and figure out where you wanna see some allowances for experimentation to happen. But it's, it's going to require everyone to let go a little bit um, of things that are in place for very, very good reasons. But if you can have a controlled pilot in some of these spaces, we could um, really try to catalyze a lot of these new business models um, that Stuart was talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, as Samira said, I mean, it's, uh, you, we've got some examples of statutory changes, uh, such as the P3 experiment that, that specifically allows for certain areas for money to be blended much more uh, effectively. I think we do have some progress between agencies. Uh, uh, I, I do agree with Lauren that if we had one pot of money, it'd be a lot better, but it may be a few years before we have a single payer system uh, here in the United States. Um, but that said, I think uh, looking at different structures that allow this kind of cooperation. I mentioned the children's cabinets at the, st at the, um, at the state level, and I think looking at it in that way, and, and thinking about new structures generally. And sometimes, sometimes it may not be possible to blend at the national level, but when the money gets further down the system, there may be opportunities for doing it there. The state of Maryland, for example, has a whole system of so-called local management boards, and these are county-level institutions, either nonprofit or government institutions. And their role is to, take, is to have the money coming down the system, both uh, public money, federal and state, and, and private money, and look at ways of working with people in the community to, to literally kind of link that money together where they really are the blenders at that level to enable a, a small organization locally that couldn't, wouldn't have the capacity to apply for different grants from different agencies uh, to actually just go to the local management board and have essentially blended money given to them to do some interesting creative things locally. So, so I think when you start looking at it in that way, the institutional structures, there's a lot of opportunity for us to be creative uh, in that area, not just from the top, but to allow kind of bottom-up approaches. So state action is really important, and then the setting up of these kinds of uh, creative bodies, these new structures to facilitate it. I just add one, one thing, uh, because what's happening at, at state and municipal levels is in fact an integration in some places of health and human services. So you're seeing some places that are actually trying to do this mm -hmm. very thing. And I, I would encourage you, um, you know, a place, Connecticut, mm -hmm. San Diego, um, I, I, off the top of my head are places that have been moving ahead with this. But, you know, they're really thinking hard about this problem. Of, of different pots of do dollars that from wildly different areas, you know, everything from public benefit dollars like, you know, WIC to healthcare dollars uh, and then community development dollars. And they're sort of thinking holistically about how you sort of think about all of that for the benefit of health. Uh, so uh, this is not a figment of, of this panel's imagination. There are people that are actually doing this. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to go to the two questions at the mics and then we're gonna to get to a whole slew of green card questions we have about Medicaid flexibility and block grants. So get ready. So if you could identify yourself, please. Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Courtney Platson. I am a family nurse practitioner and I live and work here in the district. I work at a federally qualified health center where I work at a community health center and I do uh, medical outreach to the homeless. And just to talk about your exact last point, um, here in the DC, we are getting ready for Health Homes 2, where we're trying to improve care coordination for some of the district's sickest uh, patients. And one of the things that has been encouraging is when we come to the table, there's lots of different sectors. So we have people from housing, from mental health care, from the hospitals, from community health centers. Um, everyone's coming to the table and the will is there. But one of the major roadblocks that we keep facing is how do we do care coordination when none of our systems communicate? So we want to de decrease duplication of services. When a patient is in the emergency department, we want to get them to see their primary care provider, but I never know my patient went to the ER. So this has been a huge roadblock for us, and we're trying to do implement social determinants of health screening tools at our health center. So we're trying to create all this infrastructure, but we feel like we're all in our silos doing our own work, and the will is there, but without any kind of um, system for us to communicate, it becomes a huge challenge. So I wanted to hear if there's any innovation or any innovative work that's happening across the country or ideas for how to, how to make that work better. I, I think one area to look at is 
uh, I mean, and I'm very sympathetic and I know a little bit about what you're talking about in the District of Columbia. Um, but I think one, one opportunity may be to look at the role of intermediary organizations sort of within this. So in other words, how you can use an intermediary institution to link together different uh, organizations. I mentioned the local management boards uh, in Maryland. If you go to Baltimore, you can go visit the Family League of Baltimore, for example, which is an, an intermediary institution that works with people with, it does the kind of coordination uh, that you're dealing with. Not only that, it actually is increasingly trying to, 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 to carry out the data uh, piece, to be able to link data together. So, some, so, so it's a sophisticated organization that can actually do the kind of data analysis and linkages that it's maybe not possible for institutions with it, you know, individually within each sector. So I think looking at uh, uh, intermediaries uh, in that way can be a very important one. Even at a simple level, um, uh, there's an organization called Health Leads based in Boston. Um, which simply is Im embeds um, uh, people within hospitals uh, to figure out when somebody's being discharged, what are the services that they need? So if they're a homeless person, for example, or somebody where housing is an important issue, uh, they can identify this, sign people up, do this, just not as a cost to the hospital, but as a cost to a philanthropic organization. Robert Johnson's uh, foundation, among others, supports this. So there are ways, I think, of using intermediaries to deal with the issue that you're talking about. It's not only a question of getting the various departments or people together and figuring out who takes the lead. There can be somebody that does that. I think that's one, one form of, of a change in business model kind of thinking that might work. Um, I kind of, it, we have to sort of realize this is a systemic issue uh, and people are trying to solve actually a number of problems, and I, we've mentioned some of them. One is financing, uh, others, one other is data, because you, you can't do this without data systems talking to each other, uh, much less people. And I think, as, as, and the third thing which, which um, Stuart pointed out is, is we need new governance models. So how do we, how do we structure ourselves? Because we, you know, this, if it's going to be a system, we have, to, we have to be in relationship to each other, and intermediary is one way to do that. I've seen places that simply form their own bodies and create their own intermediaries. And I think the fourth area is, is practice, and because ultimately this it just means we can't go into our corners, do our respective work, and, ex and think that's going to get a, a better result, because it really is about changing how we work with each other. So um, you know, one astounding fact that I heard from police departments, at least in big cities, is that police officers spend 80% of their time on social services. Think about that. And if, if you know, so police officers basically front our, our, our first responders in the social service system. Um, the LA PD decided to create a whole new unit to deal with this so that not every police officer would have to do this. So, I mean, that's one example of how we change. I mean, to talk about a doctor talking about social determinants what is, what is, I, I keep saying, so what is the script for that? I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no pharmaceutical that you can prescribe, right? And so Health Leads is actually a good example of, of how you sort of make that transfer happen. So, and that goes back to how we train people in the system, you know, including doctors. I mean, are they going to be ready for this new world? Great, I so, oh yes? I could just jump in with, it sounded like a question that had a tech component to it. And so I would just point out, again, I'd hit the HIPAA concern, like that it seems to be the big thing that keeps people from developing these EHR, electronic health record plugins. But in some cases, I know in Massachusetts, they have worked through it and are using state funded dollars to do referrals from hospitals and from providers out to the community. They've not yet figured out how to do referrals back in the other direction, which is an additional challenge. But the bright star in this space, I think, is Parkland Health System in Dallas. And there's a physician there who developed a software platform, essentially, and has now spun it off as a private business that's called Pieces. But what's really neat about it is they got all of the kind of social service providers and Parkland Health System on one tech platform such that when a hospital, sorry, when a doctor's patient pinged on a homeless shelter or a food pantry, they did get an alert. And last I checked, they were kind of toying around with some different payment models such that 
you know, a small amount of money for a health system can actually be a meaningful amount of money for some of these nonprofits who are doing the social service delivery. So they were toying with each time my patient pings off one of these other service delivery entities in the city, $100 gets kind of sent from my flexible funding out to that service provider. And so that was kind of the most progressive thing I've seen to date about really being able to A, have a map um, both in your head and in the computer about where people could potentially be and have gone and hook that up so that the next time someone comes in, I get a listing if I'm the physician of, okay, I see on April 18th you were here and then you were there. Um, so that would be my advice of a place to go and get inspired. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Sonia Clay with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, I guess, first of all, I wanted to say that our family physicians and our leaders support the need to educate physicians, primary care physicians, about social determinants and um, a physician's role in coordinating care for their patients. But I've heard a lot of discussion about shifting funds away from medical care, but wanted to just assert that not all medical care is the same, um, and that many cases, primary care has been shown uh, to help reduce mortality, and, and to improve health outcomes, and really wanted to get your thoughts on that. So again, I think we would assert that there needs to be more investments in primary care and primary care access um, versus expensive hospital care or specialty care. So just wanted to get your response to that. I have one quick response to that. In the research I've been doing on hospital community benefit spending, I've had a number of more public health and, and like kind of health policy experts say to me, stop pushing on hospitals. They don't have the right business model incentives, like Stuart said, to do this. It's the insurance companies and the providers directly if you can bake it into the um, payment models. And that's why payment system reform and that first question on ACOs and health homes and all that was really powerful and important because it's the providers at the end of the day who, a lot, I mean, a lot of providers are out there to make money, but a lot went into this to actually help people and make them healthier. And if you can come up with the right, um, to give them the right business model and payment system where they're being paid for this in the right ways, it would be transformative. And it has to operate at the provider level as well. You can't expect it to just ha happen with the hospitals doing this work. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with that. Uh, and as I said, when I talked about the business models, often the business models are really the product of the payment system itself. And so they're distorted, in my view, uh, because of that. So partly it's we're trying to dig ourselves out of that payment-led business model. I totally agree with you uh, that, in general, uh, if one looks at, uh, at primary care, you're going to and focus on that and build that up, you're going to get savings in, in the health system down the road, uh, in addition, of course, to, to investing in the social service and housing and these sorts of areas. I think one challenge that comes up uh, and you see this with, with recently with the pediatricians, in terms of you know, pediatricians being encouraged to ask all kinds of questions about food and so on. Okay, so when they see a problem, what do they do then? You know, and who, you know, does, does this just sit in the record uh, and nothing else happens? Who gets the other sectors involved? And so I think when, when you start to look at it that way, that's why I think in many ways it is a switching of money. It's a, it's a question of saying within the health sector, let's start moving money around so that some of these other things, not just that you switch more towards primary care uh, to get savings down the road in the health system, but also that maybe you start to undertake some of the elementary social services or pay for them through the health system itself. So then the sector itself is not being asked to shrink, but what it's doing is going to be different in the future and recognizing that some of the first responders, so to speak, um, right now, if when they see these issues, they're not in a position to do much about it. Just like a teacher or a, or a school nurse often uh, can see all kinds of problems, but they don't have the backup, they don't have the money to actually go and deal with the problem that's causing the child to act up in school or not come or drop out. You know, I, 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 I would call out the pediatricians and AAP in particular for, for being great advocates for um, you know, social determinants. I, I think you, you know, AAP in particular has been a great champion of, of sort of thinking about, about that. So uh, I, I, we have certainly been supportive of primary care as part of our work. The, the, I, it would be remiss of me not to, to mention something because we've been talking a lot about the money in the healthcare system and there's a lot of money there that could be better spent. I think 
probably everyone in the room would agree on that. But in fact, um, you know, this is this is kind of a total game if we're serious about health, and that is that. You know, many of you probably heard the expression health in all policies. And the, the idea being that, you know, all of our investments have impact on health. And, you know, education is an important one. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of data to show that, you know, the, the way to, to live a long, healthy life is to get a, uh, some kind of post high school degree, uh, delay marriage before having kids, and you're, you're going to be okay probably for the rest of your life. You know, um, but a lot of people don't, in fact, have that. And so, um, so th there's obviously a deep connection between education and, and long-term long health. But how do we think about our total investment in, in people? And I think that's the important thing here is, you know, what, what can we do to sort of think about how we invest in people to make sure that they have a long life um, from the very get-go uh, as children all the way, you know, to the end of life, you know, which all of us are going to have to be dealing with soon. I would just add the last comment that my goal when I think about all this stuff is to let doctors go back to being doctors. And people often hear me as, Lauren, you're pulling doctors and hospitals into all this other stuff, the housing and the schools and yada yada. And the idea is I think the system has to be very connected and integrated so that individual professionals can specialize. And so that's the kind of dream I'm chasing, if you will. And in these integrated solutions that I have seen that are happening, that we profiled in the book, the best thing I heard was when physician, a physician said to me, since we started this partnership with a community service center, I get to go back to being an internist. I was trained as an internist. I get jazzed about internisty things. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a nutritionist. And I'm not a psychologist. And I have had to fake it as being all of those things, the same way that police officers have to fake it and teachers have to face it, fake it. Any system that can't say no bears the burden of a broken safety net. And so right now, hospitals who can't say no bears the burden. And so they get people who they just have to fake it in all these other roles. And I think the idea is if you can create a system where the referral lines are clean and the contracts are there and the backup and the supports are available, then as physicians, you get to go back to being physicians. So that's my dream. I hear you and thank you. And I will say family physicians, we treat people from birth to death. So we also embrace the role of helping patients navigate through various systems as well. So thank okay, you. OK, thank you. So we have a number of uh, questions that have come in about Medicaid. And of course, with any new administration, any new Congress, there are a lot of unknowns. Um, but uh, folks seem to be uh, wanting to know about Medicaid block grants in particular and what the impact of block granting Medicaid could potentially have on social determinants. As a second part to this question, we have other folks who would like to know what uh, tax reforms could, um, what impact, what the, uh, you know, where we could end up with that is regard to social determinants. And also, what happens uh, if the next administration eliminates CMS's Innovation Center? So a lot of unknowns. Mostly, folks are interested in knowing the potential impact of Medicaid block grants on social determinants. Not everybody at once, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I am afraid that I'm being naive in saying this, so let me go on record by saying I'd like to be able to take it back. But I actually, I understand the concerns about block granting Medicaid, and the concerns are legitimate, that if you set a total amount, you give it to the state, and the state falls on hard times, or the economy crashes, there just may not be enough money in that pool of funds to support the kind of swell that will arrive on the doors of the Medicaid office. I don't know how to work through that problem exactly, but I do think that the idea of block granting Medicaid could be a great thing for social determinants of health in so much as it would give some of the flexibility back um, and allow for this kind of braiding or blending that we've been chasing in this little neck of the woods that is the social determinants of health crew and health policy. Um, I would say I know that in Massachusetts, like. For decades, people have been banging their head against the wall trying to figure out how to use Medicaid funds for particular social determinants of health type things, the air conditioners, 
you know, lead remediation, mold remediation, housing, you know, it's always a fight. Can Medicaid dollars be used for housing or just the supportive part of supportive housing? And to date, that's been a fight that the state has mostly lost. And, you know, the feds have been very narrow about what they think Medicaid dollars can be used for. And it's been a struggle to try and make those upstream investments with Medicaid dollars because the feds have been very clear that Medicaid is for health care. Um, and so I wonder, and this is not my area of expertise, but if we go to a block grant model, there could actually be some latitude for experimentation and upstream investment. I'm not going to answer that question directly, uh, but I will say that um, the states that have taken like the 1115 waiver district like in New York, um, you're seeing some terrific innovation about how to move upstream and how to, and uh, I just came from New York and um, a big contract with social service agencies in that city and the child welfare system. Um, so there's clearly, you know, some opportunities to sort of really think about more broadly about how to impact health of populations. But if you go back to um, uh, Lauren's slide showing the kind of the heat, the heat map, uh, that heat map also, um, if, you, if you were to overlay that with like, um, like mortality, morbidity data, it would map pretty close. And here's a concern, that um, not all states would be as wise sort of thinking about block grants. Uh, and the states that are racing ahead will race even further ahead. And the states that are lagging behind will sink even further. So that to me is a danger of, of, of not, of uh, if we would need to have very strong guardrails around something like that because the, the opportunity, I agree, on the, on the upside is, is, very good, is very big, but you know, we can't simply have states continuing to sort of fall further and further you know, behind. You know, we're, we, think about this. For the, first, uh, for the first time ever, we are seeing increased mortality rates among white working class women and men. Um, that's unheard of in a civilized world. I mean, Everybody's been improving. Even the, even the poorest citizens in this country have been gradually improving year to year on mortality. And now we're seeing a failure. And that's a failure not of people, it's a place. So, um, you know, I, I just keep that in mind as, as, as we, and those places kind of map to, you know, those red, those red zones. And so I would just be cautious if we, before we move on policy. Um, what I'll say here is just, um, it's always important to think about Block granting will get you flexibility, but at the end of the day, as we all know, these programs still have some sort of federal accountability, some things that we're managing and measuring at the federal level. So you just have to think about, your, people are gonna manage what you tell them to measure, so you just have to be thoughtful what rules you put in place if you really wanna drive social determinants of health to be part of that system. And then the second thing I'll do is point us back to Lauren's slide. The, 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 the total allocation of spending between the two systems is, um, I think, a really powerful lens to think of this through and be thoughtful about whether reforms in one place are just going to squeeze people into another part of the system and how can you make sure that we're just spending the dollars more wisely across all the systems, not just narrowing one piece of that um, larger integrated system. I, I think we're all saying that there are, is potential for real um, success in using a block grant model uh, to pursue uh, social determinants if it's done right with the appropriate guardrails. I think you know, the, question, the discussion of block grants gets mixed up, first of all, in the budget question. And some people think block grant is merely a way of reducing spending on poor people. OK. Uh, uh, and then also, I think there's concern that, um, that, that giving flexibility to states means, you know, name your southern state, certainly won't, uh, just won't do what's required. But if you think of it uh, in, in a more broader way, and I think most conservative economists, uh, health uh, uh, analysts like myself and others kind of think about this, first of all, we think of it as a per capita uh, arrangement, so that that way, if the proportion of people who fall into poverty during a business cycle increases, so therefore the Medicaid money also pursues, but it becomes a, a, a block of money, a piece of, uh, an amount of money kind of related to the person that can be flexible. And also that it's done in the context of essentially the waiver model of how the federal government and the state manages 
the Medicaid program. As, as uh, David said, if you look at the 1115 waivers, there's been incredible innovation uh, as a result of that. But that, the way that waiver works, or any waiver like that works, is the federal government essentially is saying, this is the outcome we're looking for. And uh, come with your proposal. And if you're not, you know, if you meet the conditions, the guardrails and so on, it looks really interesting, then go ahead and we're going to evaluate it. I think it's critical to have that model in place with a, with a block grant uh, of Medicaid uh, and also with the evaluation because, of course, it's evaluation not just for the particular state but to draw the general lessons from that experiment so that other states can see it and can emulate it or refine it or try a variant in some other ways. It's got to be a dynamic model like that across state lines as well as from the federal government to the state. With regard to the uh, innovation uh, center, um, I think that uh, well, I think uh, it's going to be under fire, to put it mildly. Um, but I think when you think of innovation, you can think of it as kind of bottom up or top down. I think the innovation center is an example of a, a top down view of experimentation, where where the uh, the center itself has a kind of a preconceived view of what it thinks is going to be. Uh, a good development, like ACOs and so on, and then tries to push uh, experiments kind of down the system. The alternative vision is kind of what you've been hearing about on this panel, which is the bottom-up sort of view, to say, well, let's see what's cooking out there, and let's then make it easier for that to happen. I think if the innovation center became much more like that, of saying, what's out there? What can we do in Washington to facilitate what you're doing, measure it, give you some funding, and so on? But we're not coming in with a preconceived view of exactly what happens. First of all, I think that would be more effective. And I think, secondly, it would be much more in line with the philosophy of both the Congress now, the, the um, majority in Congress and the administration, and the new administration. So we're coming down to our last couple of questions. So I want to remind everybody to please fill out your blue evaluation form before you leave. Um, we have several folks who really want to uh, understand um, both the evidence behind cost savings and also the evidence behind uh, improving health outcomes. And um, uh, so, you know, one question is, what are the overarching goals? It, should it be to reduce costs? Should it be to improve health outcomes? Should it be both? And um, also, we have one questioner who is referring to an article at the beginning of this month in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that seemed to indicate that permanent supportive housing as an intervention uh, didn't yield net cost savings. <laughs> oh, my. Um, OK, so I didn't see the Nijam article, and whoever has a question, you're welcome to email me or think about it. I think uh, the ROI or kind of cost accounting on these things is always complicated. I'll tell you what the evidence says, and then I can pr challenge that evidence just as quickly. The evidence says that if you choose the most vulnerable populations, you do get a positive ROI. And so that goes for housing, but it's basically the theme across all of this social determinants of health literature. And it makes sense, right? Because if, you are try if you're a researcher or you're an organization doing a pilot, you want to show positive ROI. And so you select into your sample the sickest, the most chronically homeless, the ones with multiple morbidity. And so in some ways, it's a function of selection what your return on investment is going to be, right? If you choose chronically homeless people with both physical and mental kind of challenges or morbidities, then guess what? Those people are really costly now, and virtually anything you do, housing, nutrition, case management, is going to create a positive ROI. I think the really sophisticated question is, at what point, as you move up kind of a socioeconomic gradient, do you tip from positive ROI to negative ROI? And that's like a magic question in the literature that we don't yet know. I would say the added complication about measuring this stuff is, you know, as was alluded to before, it, it matters if you count the initial investment. So for instance, from a, from a healthcare perspective, healthcare organization's perspective, someone coming in and making a housing investment could look fabulous if it's decreasing kind of uh, the costs associated with a very kind of chronically homeless uh, population. So it can look 
positive, but then if you step back and you say, okay, now we also want to take into account the cost of the actual housing, meaning we want to take a more holistic approach, then it can flip negative. And so all of these studies are just a little bit complicated in that way. You can kind of find studies that say, in some ways, whatever you want. I do think on housing, the preponderance says that for chronically homeless individuals and families, housing is a positive ROI, but I would never tell you that I think this is a clean literature or a unanimous literature. Partly, I would say, because we don't have something like the NIH funding social service investments and measuring the return on investment from a social service perspective. And so I always caution people, if you're sitting as the head of a health system or the head of a Medicaid agency, and you're trying to figure out what to do with a marginal dollar, if you're just looking at how high is the stack of evidence, the stack of evidence will always be higher for the medical investment, right? You're always gonna have more available evidence for the MRIs and for the new drugs, et cetera. So I think we need to get out of this idea that being evidence-based means you just go with whatever has the most evidence. I think we could also look at the quality of evidence and kind of ask difficult questions about why don't we have as much evidence over here? And it's because it hasn't been funded, it hasn't been thought about, there are ethical challenges. So the measurement is a long and difficult uh, discussion and it just takes some time, but I'm on call if anyone wants to uh, do some translation with me. Uh, the only thing I'd wanna add to that is um, that uh, when we talk about things like cost saving and health outcome improvements, it's some interventions are gonna be evidence-based and then they're gonna be the replicators out there. And why I think the Social Innovation Fund at CNCS is really interesting is because they provide funding to like do replications, but they also provide technical assistance because not every program is going to be run well. And so they offer technical assistance so that the new groups who are trying to start and replicate get the support they need to run it well. Yeah, I, I think as Lauren said, one of our problems in this area is, is really this thinking about intersector collaboration is relatively new. Uh, and and the, the research, the data is just not caught up with, with the, what's going on in the field. And so we do need to have an investment in really measuring this, sometimes it's called the social return on investment, the broader multi-sector uh, return, and developing the methodology as well as funding the studies. There are groups like the, um, uh, the American Public uh, Human Services Association has done a lot of interesting work kind of looking at methodology. Uh, Council on Large Public Housing Authorities is going to be very interested in, this, in these connections between housing and health in, uh, in particular, and they're making progress in this, in this area. But the, but the fact is that we have a dearth. We don't have enough analysis in this area to make it uh, clear what the impacts are. And, there's a pro and, and the problem then from that, among other things, it's, it then becomes hard to convince budget committees and so on to start changing the funding if you can't demonstrate it. So we really do need um, uh, enormous investment in this area uh, from the research side uh, to show these kinds of connections, what actually pays off and how one sector can benefit from an investment in another sector for that first sector's objectives. And just, uh, just a very quick comment on, on cost versus outcomes. Are, most, are people familiar with the triple aim that was Institute for Healthcare Improvement? Some of you are. I mean, uh, we, we really have to do we have to get better outcomes and lower costs, and we have to get um, better population health. I mean, so those are the three aims, you know, a better quality of care, uh, lower cost per capita, and better population health. And, and, and even though the IHI kind of came up with that idea, I think it's pretty well accepted now in the industry that this is kind of the standard that, we're, that we have to achieve. So one at the, at the expense of the other really won't get us there. Okay, we, we are a little bit over our time. Let's see if we can handle the last question at the mic. And do you have a question also? Yeah. So let's see if we can keep both of them really short. Well, Carl Polzer, I've um, been working with long-term care providers on policy issues for many years. There's a real strong institutional bias with long-term care toward nursing homes. Mm -hmm. As people said, they get paid for both housing and health care. But home and community-based settings, where more the emphasis is now, and, at home and in assisted living, it, they, under Medicaid law, you can't get paid for housing. So the states usually use SSI, Supplemental Security Income, of about $8,000 a year to pay for the housing, which is about half of what you need to put somebody in assisted living. Or, so the issue, another thing to put on the table would be a supplement for SSI 
for people that are nursing home eligible in Medicaid, and you might be able to get the numbers for up in assisted living above 200,000, where you got a million people plus getting nursing home services under Medicaid. Just some reaction. Mm. I agree. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the last Great. question. Marcia, uh, excuse me, it's like very, Marcia Greenfield from Leading Age, and we represent nonprofit aging services, housing, and providers, and, and healthcare providers. And I just wanted to comment that there is actually some very interesting research going on on the use of service supported senior housing as a way of reducing Medicare and hopefully Medicaid costs, both the SASH project in Vermont. Um, the Center for Applied Research, our research center, has done some um, really in-depth look at using supportive housing um, as a way of reducing health care costs. And I think that we will see more of that as we go on. So I wish my housing people had come to this because I think that they could have also added to this conversation. And I want to thank you because this has been really very, very interesting. Great. Please join me in thanking our panel for a very interesting conversation that I'm sure will go on for quite some time. And if I could ask you one more time to please just take a moment to fill out your evaluation form. It'll help us to help you. Thank you for being here today.